So, listen up. This is good. Mohammed, please. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Anybody who's born in January, February, or March, please stand up. Do me a favor. Put your hands like this. Perfect. Anybody who's born in April, May, or June, please stand up. Now, do the same, but press your hands together. Perfect. Anybody who's born in July, August, or September, please stand up. Do me a favor. Do this. Great. Anybody who's born in October, November, December, please stand up. And anybody who's still seated, <laughs> I don't know where you're from, but do this. All right. Now, I want to ask you a favor. Nobody moves. <laughs> you see, now when I post this, I can claim that you guys gave me a standing ovation. So thank you for that. Please have a seat. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I need a volunteer. Anybody. Don't worry, I'm not going to embarrass you. Juliana. Yeah, volunteer, yeah, anybody. <laughs> oh, please, let's give a hand, everybody. Hi, can you put your hands like this? Okay, a little bit higher and come this way. Fantastic. Now, I want you to turn around, face your audience. All right, I'm going to stand here away from you. What's your name? Julianne. And where are you from? Brazil. Fantastic. I would love to visit one day. Now, slowly close your hands. Just don't squeeze it. Just fan a little more, a little more. Stop. Fantastic. Now, are you a left-handed or right-handed person? Are you a left-handed or right-handed? Right, okay. So put your left hand behind your back. Keep your right hand up there. Now, I'm going to need a second volunteer. Alex. Alex, where is Alex? Let's give him a hand, everybody. How are you doing, Alex? Now, you're going to be my assistant today because I want to be as far away from you as possible. Keep in mind, we're not, I'm not close to her. I'm not touching her or anything, right? Now, this, okay, this is some sugar. Are you diabetic? Diabetic. Now, fantastic. I want you to open this packet. I want you to pour some sugar on the top of her head. Just a little bit, not too much, you know. Fantastic. Now, I want you to rub the sugar off until it's all gone. Is it gone? Gone. All right, can you have a seat, please? Let's give him a hand again. Do you believe that I can control your body? See, I'm standing right here. We're far away from each other. However, I can control your bloodstream from here. I can make the blood in her body absorb the sugar that you just rubbed off. And I'm going to transfer that sugar to somewhere else. You're skeptical, right? You don't believe it. Just give me a minute. Just, yeah, just keep looking at me. I can feel it. Do you feel something happening? Do you feel something happening? What do you feel? Okay. Now, I have transferred the sugar through her bloodstream to the palms of her hand. Can you look at your palm of your hand? Is there some sugar there? 
Can you show it to everybody? Keep in mind, I didn't touch her. I was here the whole time. Anybody here who's impressed? Who's impressed? Now, why are you impressed? Thank you so much, Jill, by the way. Appreciate it. Why are you impressed? Anybody? Why is this impressive? What is that? But why is it impressive? How so? And now it transferred to the palm of their hand, right? Yep. Now, the reason why this is impressive, and this is, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, every trick in the book when it comes to like magic tricks. The reason why this trick is impressive is because I was here the whole time. I didn't approach her. I, I even got a volunteer to do the sugar thing. I didn't touch her hands the entire time. And that's why it was an impressive trick. Is that correct? You were impressed because I didn't approach her. I wasn't close to her. I didn't plant anything on her. I was here the entire time. But is that true, though? What happened when she first walked on the stage? What did you do? I said, put your hands like this. And what did I do? I already planted the sugar in her hand from the beginning. And I kept my position here. And the entire time, I kept on saying, I'm not touching you. I'm away from you. And with my words, I planted in your mind that... This is an awesome trick because I was nowhere near her, even though it was done in the beginning. Thank you, Julia. Could you please have a seat? Let's give her a hand, everybody. And the same, ladies and gentlemen, could be said with any magic trick. If you really look deep into it, you'll find out it's just it's an easy thing to implement. But if you notice, the magician is always talking. No magician will do the tricks silently. They always talk. And the reason is because when, you, when people talk, you're listening to their words and you're just immersed in their words and you actually might ignore what they have been doing the entire time because they've been talking the entire time. They've been drawing you in with their words. And this, ladies and gentlemen, what we'll be talking about today, the power of words. Anybody has heard of Hans Scarf? Now, Hans Karp was a German interrogator in the Nazi army in World War II. And the Nazis have committed atrocious and horrible things. But Hans was, was, was one of the most effective interrogators in the German army. Even though he never threatened, he never tortured, he never yelled, and he never hurt any of the prisoners. His tactic was the following. He walks into the prison, he goes to the prisoner, and at the first time he just offers them food. He doesn't ask anything. What do you need? There you go. And he leaves. He comes a few days later, he offers them something else. And he leaves. And he treated them with respect, he treated them nicely. And then, with time on, he used to take walks with the prisoners around the prison. And just let them speak. He doesn't ask them questions. He doesn't interrogate them. He just let them speak. By the account of so many prisoners, he was the only friend that they ever had. And he was able to extract so much information from these people without laying a finger on any of them. In fact, after the war, he was actually transferred to the United States and he was teaching in the United States his tactics. And the tactics is when people get threatened, when their pride is at a question, people will close off and will shut off. But when you're becoming their friends, they will open up to you and talk more to you. I had the same experience with my child. I had a child who's about four year old, and I walked into, into his room one day, and I saw him with his crayon, 
writing on the walls. And my first reaction was like, hey, what is wrong with you? Don't you ever do that again. And guess what happened? He did it again. Why? Because as I said, nobody wants his pride to be touched. Nobody wants to be forced to do anything. The very next day, I walked into his room, and again, he's writing on the wall. And this time, he was even looking at me just... And I looked at him and I said softly, you know, you're a big boy now. You can't do this. Only kids do that. You're a big boy now. And he never did it again. Because again, his pride doesn't want him to be just a little boy. And the same thing, ladies and gentlemen, in our line of work. When you threaten people, that you are not going to get anything out of them. But when you show them that you want the best for them and for yourself and for the organization, when you show them that you are, your, they are, you are their friends, they will be more open to open up and talk more. I was at a coffee shop once with two of my friends. And one of them was a, was a hardcore Barcelona fan. And the other one was a hardcore Real Madrid fan. And they started arguing about which team is better. And I'm sitting there just watching the argument. And the guy who, who's a fan of Real Madrid, he started to say, you know, our team is the best. We have won the most league tournaments in the, like in the history of Europe. We won the most whatever in the history of Spain. We won whatever. And then once he was done, the other guy said, man, we have... We have Messi, you have nobody. That was back when like, Messi was in the team. And I observed something. The first guy was talking about the accomplishments of the team. And just as soon as it was finished, the second guy just said, we have Messi, you have nobody. Which indicated that the second guy was not even listening to the argument of the first guy. He was just waiting for him to shut up so he can say his thing. And this shows a disrespect to the person that you are with. When, like listening is not just sitting there just waiting for the person to finish talking. Listening is really tentatively listen to what the person is saying. And then base your argument on whatever you just said. Not just waiting for the person to stop talking so you can say your piece. A very good trick to show that the person that you're speaking to, that you have been paying attention the entire time is, when the person is done talking, you should repeat the last thing that that person said. For example, if I asked you, ma'am, where are you from? South Africa. Where in South Africa? Durban. I've been to Johannesburg, but I've never been to Durban. So tell me, how is the weather there? It's very similar to here. Now, you see how the conversation is going. I asked her where she's from. She said, and I repeated, South Africa. Where in South Africa? She said, Durban. I repeated again, Durban. This indicated that I've been listening to you. I'm not just waiting for you to say whatever you want to say, and then I say my, my, myself. So this is a technique that I encourage you all to say. Like, whenever you're speaking to anybody, repeat the last thing that the person ever said. Why? You're indicating to them that I'm not just waiting for you to stop talking so I can say my stuff. I've been listening attentively to you the entire time. There was a professor in a university in Michigan who wanted to do an experiment with his students. So he walked into the class one day with a jar full of M&Ms and a bowl and a spoon. And he asked for a volunteer from the audience. And when the volunteer came in, he said, I want you in 10 seconds to use the spoon to get as many M&Ms from the jar into the bowl. Clear? He said, clear. 
Everybody in the class, let's start counting. Ten, nine, eight. And the guy is just shoveling as many M&Ms into the bowl. By the end, the bowl was full. He said, thank you, sir. Please have a seat. He returned the M&Ms into the bowl again and asked for a second volunteer. And when the second volunteer came in, he said, I want you to do the same thing. However, every green M&M is worth five points. Are you ready? He said, yes. Everybody, let's start counting. Ten, nine, and the guy again is trying to get as many. Sure, he's trying to get the green ones, but he's shoveling nonetheless. By the end, the ball is again full. Thank you, sir. Please have a seat. He asked for a third volunteer. He said, I want you to do the same thing. However, every red M&M is minus five points. What do you think the third guy did? Everybody was counting. This guy was very carefully trying not to get any green, I mean, like any red M&Ms. By the end, only just a little bit of M&M was in the bowl. And the conclusion that this professor had from this experiment is, when we think about what could go wrong, we achieve so little. But when we think about opportunities and what could go right, we achieve a lot more. In fact, I'm going to give you an experiment right now, and I want you, when you go back to your offices, to observe what I'm about to do with you now, because it's going to happen in your next office meeting. I want one of you here to give me an idea, an innovative idea that will make your work more fun or more productive. Now, when that person gives me the idea, I'm going to point at different people in the audience. And I want you to start adding to that idea, but I want you to start with the phrase, yes, but. All right. Anybody here has an idea that will make the work more fun? Anybody? Huh? A ping pong table. A ping pong table. Yes, but... What? We don't have rackets. Yes, but... We don't have space. <laughs> we don't have the balls. All right. Yes, but... You don't have the space in the office. Great. Yes, but... We don't have the time because we're extremely busy. All right. Yes, but... Huh? We don't have players. Yes, but... We don't even know how to play. Now, the idea was a good idea at the beginning. How do you think he, he's going to feel? Oh, you guys are not taking my idea. I'm not even going to share anything with you anymore. This is going to be his reaction. Why? Because when he started the idea, we only looked at what could go wrong. We killed it right away. And this is how a lot of innovation die. Because we only looked at the negatives. Now, we're going to do the same experiment again. But I want a different idea now, okay? However, instead of yes, but, let's do yes and. Anybody here has a different idea that will make the workplace more fun? Anybody? Huh? A baseball club. All right? Yes and. So we can like dedicate one hour a week for that. Fantastic. Yes, and we can get the professional equipment. Yes, and it will be a good exercise with the office. Yes, and it will make us work as a team. Now, notice his idea was just baseball. <laughs> Now we're, beginning, now we're becoming professionals, and, and now we're working as a team. And, and now the idea actually grew and flourished. Because we didn't immediately look at what could go wrong. 
we looked at what could go right. And I encourage you all to do the same thing when you're having a brainstorming session or something similar in your offices is don't start with yes, but. Let's do yes, and. We always hear the phrase, there are no dumb questions or there are no dumb ideas, but we always kill them at the beginning by looking at what could go wrong. Now, I'm not saying that you should be reckless, but I'm saying we shouldn't kill an idea at the beginning. Do you think that we're racist? Anybody? Do you think we're sexist? Do you think I'm sexist, for example? You know, there is something called the hidden bias, which means that even though we strive as much as possible to treat everybody equal, to treat everybody the same, but there's something within us that will make us unconditionally look at people in a different light. Treat people differently just because we already made a prejudgment at the beginning. Anybody has heard of the story of Brendan Dassey? Now, Brendan Dassey, which is the young boy over there, his uncle was wrongfully wrongfully he was wrongfully convicted with a sex crime. He was convicted of raping a woman, and he spent 18 years in prison. And after 18 years, DNA evidence came in and proved that he was actually innocent. And he was released. Now imagine, you've been wrongfully imprisoned for 18 years. You hate the system. And that's exactly what he did. He sued the police for wrongfully accusing him of that crime. Now, during the, the trial between him and the, uh, and the police, a woman goes missing. And then a few days later, they found her car near his house. How do you feel if you are in the police force? This guy, in your mind, might have a history, even though he was cleared. But now the car is near his house. He is suing us. We don't really like him. They, the police already decided in their mind that this guy is guilty. But they couldn't find anything against him. So they went to his nephew, Brandon, who was like 16 at the time. And Brandon has some mental issues. Like he, he's a slow kid. And they had him interrogated for four hours. And during the entire interrogation, they were asking him questions that they already decided in their mind. Brandon, just tell us that your uncle did this and we will do whatever it takes to help you. We know he raped this woman. We know he might have killed her or something. And they kept on like this for four hours. The poor young boy just wanted to go home. And he told the police what they wanted to hear. He even said, yeah, I was there and I helped him to kill this woman. And they imprisoned both of them. And if you go to Netflix, there is a, a whole documentary about this entire story. They found out that both of them were actually innocent. But if I keep telling you that you're guilty, if I keep persisting to you that you're the one who did it, you know, I, just because I don't like the way that you look, or I don't like the way that you dress, or I don't like where you came from, or, you're, or what like an that you are, because I already made in my mind that you're guilty, I will do whatever it takes to prove my thesis. And this is called the racist bias, meaning that sometimes we already in our mind, made up our mind that somebody is guilty or somebody is, is the bad guy. And we will do whatever it takes to prove our theory. And this is not the way that we should approach, especially in like our line of work in terms of fraud or whatever. We should not just approach people just because we think he did it. I'm going to try to find out or find evidence that will prove my thesis. You collect 
the evidence that you have. And then you base your thesis based on what you have, not start with the thesis in mind that you're trying to prove. Sir, where are you from? Brazil. I would love to go there again. Now, imagine that you're walking here in the streets of Dubai. And while you're walking, you find someone from Brazil. He comes to you, he speaks to you in Portuguese. I wish I can speak Portuguese better. And he speaks to you in Portuguese and he says, uh, my phone just died and I'm trying to call a cab. Can I use your phone? What would you say? Sure. Fantastic. Now, imagine that you're back in Rio de Janeiro, or Sao Paulo, whatever, and you're walking down the streets, and a Brazilian comes to you and asks you the same thing. Now it's different. Why? No, no, no. It's, by the way, it's true for everybody, but why? But how come here you are okay with it? The reason, ladies and gentlemen, is this. When you were here and you meet a fellow Brazilian, you're in a, a foreign country and you're thinking, he is the closest thing to me. He is his family now. There's a a stronger bond that connects me to this guy, even though I don't know, I mean, like, I don't know who, I mean, who he is, but we have a stronger bond because we are in a foreign country. When you're back in Brazil, everybody's like Brazilian, so <laughs> there is no stronger bonds. And the same thing applies when you're speaking to people, ladies and gentlemen, when you're using your words with people. If you establish some kind of a bond, the other person, just like you, would help that guy in here, the other person will be more open to helping you just because you have established that we have some kind of a connection. We're different than everybody else. Me and you, we're different. Maybe if you're having an interrogation with a person who is of the same race as you, or a woman like you, or a man like you, or maybe you find out that he might be a Star Wars fan or whatever, and you start talking to him about that, the person feels, okay, now we are, on a str like, we are special, me and you. And he'll be more than happy to open up to you. He'll be more than happy to, to talk even more to you. Why? Because he felt, this is a person I relate to. We're special. We're different than everybody else. You know, as we are emerging out of this pandemic, and one of the biggest reasons that we are able to do so is by use of the vaccine. Now, do you know how when a vaccine is made, how it gets like, tested. So it goes through phase one, phase two, and phase three. Now phase three is the last phase before a vaccine is actually put into the market. And phase three, how they do it is they get 2,000 people. And they split them into two groups. And in the first group, they come to them and say, we're gonna inject you with the vaccine. And they have the vaccine, and they inject him with it. They go to the second group and they say, we're going to inject you with the vaccine. But they inject them with, with just water or a fake vaccine. And then they observe both groups for side effects. And if the group who got the vaccine has way more side effects than this group, then the vaccine is not safe yet. We need to do more, you know. Like we need to like rebuild it, like whatever. However, in this group, some people have side effects. How can you have side effects if you haven't been injected with the vaccine in the first place? And this is called the placebo effect. Meaning, if your mind believes it, your body would react in the same way. Just because I told you that, I'm that I am injecting you with the vaccine, you believe that this is the vaccine. Your, and your brain programmed your body to actually act as if you were injected with the vaccine. Which means words, ladies and gentlemen, can even affect your body. 
There's a famous story that happened with like Napoleon. And the story goes that Napoleon had a prisoner that he wants to have executed. And Napoleon had his own personal doctor. And the doctor, he likes to do experiments on people. So he goes to Napoleon and he said, Your Highness, since this guy is going to die anyways, can I do something? Can I have an experiment? And Napoleon said, sure. So the doctor ordered this prisoner to be tied to a chair in an empty room and to have his face covered with a bag. And he walked into the room and he said, I am the doctor of Napoleon and he ordered you to be executed. And to be honest, I don't know what you did to piss him off, but he wanted you to die in the slowest way possible. Now, since I'm a doctor, there's a vein in the back of the human's neck. And when this vein is cut, it will bleed nonstop, slowly. So this is what we're going to do with you. We're going to cut this vein, and we're going to leave you here, slowly bleeding for hours until you die. He took a knife, he cut the vein, and he left the room, locked the door. And the guy is now handcuffed to this chair in all silence. And the only thing he hears is, His blood dripping on the floor. And six hours later, just like the doctor said, the guy died. Now, here's the funny thing the doctor actually lied. There's no vein in the back of the neck or whatever. What he did is he made a small incision, and in the bottom of the chair, there's a faucet, and he opens it up, and the faucet was dripping water on the floor. This guy was not even bleeding. But because his mind believed that this guy is going to die, six hours later, he actually did. And this is, ladies and gentlemen, how powerful words are. When we're doing some interrogation, we might face a person who is actually innocent. But because of the way that we've been talking to them, the guy started to shake and sweat and whatever. Why? Because words have an effect on the human body. And we might be thinking, aha, I got him now. Maybe you don't. Maybe because of the way that you're speaking to him, it scared him up that he, his body started to have a reaction. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, that people are not the same. Meaning that sometimes we have our own tactics and how to interrogate people, or, or like how to talk to people, or, or how to convince people. And we follow the same tactic with every single person. And we fail to understand that people are not the same. They come from different backgrounds. The way that you interact is not actually the same. A famous story that illustrates this. Anybody here has ever heard of Xerox? Now, Xerox is what? A printing company, right? Fantastic. Now, back in the 60s, Xerox was dominating the market, but now new competitors are, are start to get in. Companies like, I think it's Kodak or some other companies that wants to get in into the printing market. And the CEO of Xerox at the time got scared of the competition. So he called his head of research and the development. A doctor with thick glasses, you know, no social skills. And he said to him, I want you to get me the brightest minds in all of Los Angeles. For a whole year, I want you to come with as many inventions to put us as a company ahead of everybody else. And you have free reign. I'm not going to restrict you. Just do whatever you want. So this head of research development went and got the brightest minds, and for a whole year, they've been in this building inventing things. And again, they didn't restrict them on whatever they can do. And one of them 
invented something called the Xerox Alto, which is this computer as you see right now. Back then in the 60s, there was no mouse. There was no graphics on the screens. Everything was black and white. If you want to open a file, you have to type a command. This guy invented the very first computer with Windows and a mouse and a pointer and a clicker. You can open a file by just clicking on it, whatever. And the head of research development was impressed by this invention. And he said, the CEO is going to be ecstatic. We cannot wait to present it to him. At the end of the years, the CEO asked for, for a presentation of everything that they have invented. So they lined up the presentation. They started with ink and printers or whatever. And they left this at the very far, at, like at the very far end. Because they thought, we're going to blow his mind with this invention. Now here's the problem. The person who was giving the presentation was the head of research and development guy. Again, no social skills. This guy doesn't even have to speak. And he started his presentation like any boring presentation you would see. Hello, everybody. Today, we're going to present to you our inventions for this year. You're going to see a lot of the things that we've been working on. If you look here, and he talked like this the entire time. By the end of the presentation, the CEO is already sleeping. <laughs> so at the end, the head of research development asked, so what do you think? And the CEO, okay, the first one approved, the second one approved, everybody else, scratch it. He said, yeah, but what about this computer? Said, no, no. We're a printing company, we're not a, like we're not a software company. And that's when both of them started clashing. Again, this research and development guy has no social skills. He's not, look, he's, he wasn't very like, the, I mean, like diplomatic in dealing with the CEO. He said, this is a breakthrough. And you're saying no to it? You are the wrong person in the wrong place. And the CEO is a guy with an ego. He said, oh yeah? There is no way we're going to make this. And he pulled the plug in the entire project. The very next year, there was a convention in Los Angeles, a technology convention. And Xerox, like any other company, had a booth where they displayed their products. And who's, and who's in charge of the booth? Again, the head of research and development guy. And he insisted that to bring this computer and put it there. And who happened to walk around in that convention? None other than Steve Jobs. And he walked by the Xerox booth and saw this machine. What is this? Well, it's a mouse. What does it do? You move it and the pointer moves in the screen. He realized this is a breakthrough. So he goes to the CEO of Xerox, and he said, I am an entrepreneur with a brand new company called Macintosh, and I'm offering you 5% stocks in my company if you give me the rights to this. And since the CEO and the head of research and development already clashed, the CEO said, <laughs> yeah, sure, to it. sure, take it. It's yours. And he took it, and based on that invention, he based his own operating system called the Macintosh. And then he collaborated with Bill Gates later, who made Windows out of it too. If one person gave a presentation in a better way, if he did it well, each one of you here could have been using a Xerox phone or typing on a Xerox computer. But just because he didn't articulate his words well, millions and billions of dollars were wasted. Why? Because words, ladies and gentlemen, have that kind of an impact. Imagine that tomorrow is your last day of work. And right after, you're taking a vacation. You're traveling to your favorite destination. Your bag is already packed up. Your flight is early in the morning. 
So you go to sleep early and you set your alarm. Let me ask you this. Does the alarm wake you up? Or do you wake up before the alarm? Why? Huh? But why would you wake up before the alarm? Excitement. Because you're excited about this trip that you're going to take. Now, I want you to remember that for a minute. And I want to take you through something called the Maslow's Rule of Motivation. Anybody have seen this before? Now, Maslow's Rule of Motivation states that for anybody to achieve something higher in life, personal goal or whatever, you go through five steps. The first step, which is the bottom one, called the physical need. They need to eat, they need to be healthy, then they need to have a roof over your head. If you go to a homeless guy in the streets and ask, um, can I give you a course in self-motivation? Like, self-motivation? Dude, I need to eat first. So you need to have this meat set first. Now, luckily for all of us, we have that done. The second one is called the safety need. Ma'am, if I offer you a job that pays three times as much as you're getting paid right now, three times, but you're going to work in a country with a conflict, it's a war zone, would you do it? <laughs> no, in a war, would you do it? Why? Because when you leave your house in the morning, you want to know that you're going to come back safely at night. We, everybody has that safety need. Now, lucky, we all have that set too. Next, it's called the belonging or the love need. Ma'am, if I gave you the same job offer, pays three times as much, but you're going to work in a remote area in the Antarctic with only five people with you for a whole year, would you do it? Why? It's safe. But you still won't do it. Why? Because we need people. Friends, family. We need people look around us. And lucky for us, that's also is met. Now here's a problem, ladies and gentlemen. Most people stop at step number three. They tell themselves, I have a job that pays the bills. I'm in a safe place. I have family and friends. What else do I need? And they don't have the motivation to go forward. For them, going to work is just going to work. Just a routine job that I do every single day, just to pay the bills. Now, step number four, it's called the esteem need. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this happen before. A couple who both have excellent jobs. They live in a safe place. Everything is set. They have family and friends. And yet, they end up getting a divorce somehow. Why do you think that is? Because the husband doesn't appreciate what his wife is doing for him. Or the wife doesn't appreciate what her husband is doing for them. Do not underestimate the value of saying thank you. Sometimes people have excellent jobs that they leave because they have a horrible boss. Even though the job pays well, but my boss doesn't appreciate what I do. I don't hear a thank you. I don't hear a good job. Like, I don't hear any of that. So I hate the place that I'm in. And only if you do that, you can achieve the highest one called the self-goal need. Meaning, for you, ladies and gentlemen, what you do, it's not just a job. I want you to look at your daily work that you do. And I want you to ask yourself, how would the world would be if I didn't do my job well? You guys are doing a lot of frauds and investigations. Is that correct? Now imagine if you didn't do your job well. A criminal might get away with it. The society that you're in will become a, a much worse place because the bad guy is able to walk free. We heard earlier today a phrase, which I love, by the way, when you said, 
we need you on that wall. And yes, you are on a wall. You're not just doing this as a job, you're protecting millions and millions of people. I want you every day when you go to work to have that in mind. Just because of what I'm doing, there are millions of people who are living a better life just because of what I do. Remember when I talked earlier about waking up before the alarm? Imagine, ladies and gentlemen, if every day when you go to work, you wake up before the alarm. Because you're excited about what you're doing. That's the difference between a job and a career. A job is just something to pay the bills. A career is something that you do with passion. And I cannot commend you enough on what you guys do. You are protecting me and millions like me because of what you do. No, it's not just a job. It's way more than that. I want to end with this, ladies and gentlemen. And this is a personal story. When I was seven years old, I had a, a stuttering problem. I used to stammer a lot. And I still remember at seven years old, a teacher walks into the class and placed a book in front of me and asked me to read. And when I started reading, I started stammering. And he hit me across the face. He said, what's wrong with you? Read again. And he smacked me again. I said, read again. And with tears rolling down my face, I tried and I'm still stammering. And he said, stop, 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 stop. There is no hope out of you. He took the book and gave it to another student. But that sentence, there is no hope out of you, stuck with me. And I truly believed that there is truly no hope out of me. I am less than everybody else. I should be ashamed of myself. And for 12 years, I decided to keep my mouth shut. Because if I spoke, I'm going to be slapped again. People are going to laugh at me. You know you have childhood friends? I don't. Because I used to go to school, come home, lock myself in my room for 12 years. Why? Because there is no hope out of me. I am a broken child. However, last year of high school, one day I was about to leave school, and there's a tab on my shoulder. I looked over, and it's a fellow student. And he said to me, Muhammad, I don't think I ever heard you speak. And I remember I took a piece of paper and a pen, and I wrote, I can't speak. He looked at me and said, sure you can. But what you have is fear. If you want, I can help you. He said, in order for you to overcome any fear, you need to face the ultimate form of that fear. Tomorrow morning, stand in front of the entire school and read the morning announcement, which is a thing that we used to do in like our school. And when you're desperate, ladies and gentlemen, and somebody offers you help, even if it doesn't make sense, it's a lifeline, you'll hang on to it. So I did take his advice. I stood in front of 400 students, and I, when I started reading, I stuttered again. And I still see it to this day, 400 students laughing at me. I feel so ashamed, so disgusted. The one thing that I've been avoiding my entire life, I walk to it with my own feet. Why? Just because somebody gave me an advice? During recess, I went to him and I said, are you happy now? Is that what you wanted to see? 
You wanted to see me being humiliated in front of everybody? He said, Muhammad, it's not going to happen from the first time. Success doesn't happen from the first time. Go back and try again. And just like an idiot, I listened to him again. So the next day I stood up, I spoke, I stuttered, they laughed. The day after I did the same, they still laughed. But I noticed, every time I'm standing, some of the words I used to stutter in yesterday, I don't anymore. So he was right. And that was my first passion or my first love with speaking in front of people. I used to do it as a way to cure myself. Now, fast forward to 2015. I was competing for the World Championship of Public Speaking, which is held every year. And in 2015, I won as the best speaker in the world. The first and only speaker from the Middle East. And I do remember when I got that trophy, I, I traveled back in time in my mind. I said, how come a boy who couldn't speak his entire childhood can be the best speaker in the world? If this tells you anything, ladies and gentlemen, is impossible simply does not exist. Does not exist. Now, here's the kicker in the story. In 2018, I went to my hometown to visit my parents. And one day, I was walking, like I was at a gas station, and I'm filling my car with gas. And I looked over, and I see an old man with a cane. I looked closer. I recognized the old man. It was the teacher. The teacher that told me there is no hope out of me. <laughs> Come here. But then I decided to myself, you know what? It's been a long time ago. Let's just go and say hi. So I went to him. I shook his hand. I said, do you know who I am? I said, yes, I've seen you in the news and I'm so proud of you. I said, you know, I just want to tell you, uh, I forgive you. He said, for what, son? I said, remember when I was seven years old and you slapped me in the face and you said, there is no hope out of me anymore? And he looked at me and he said, Sorry, I don't remember. The very next year, I was having an event in Jeddah, in Saudi Arabia. And after I spoke and I came down the stage, people come to me to take pictures of me and say hi, whatever. And throughout the crowd, I saw a man. I looked closer. I recognized him. The student who told me to stand and speak in front of people. The guy who made me who I am today because of his advice. So I went to him, I shook his hand, and I said, I just want to thank you. And he said, for what? I said, I just want to thank you for your advice. You remember when we were in high school and you said, I should stand in front of people and start speaking. And he said, I don't remember. In both cases, two people just said some words and they don't even remember. But they were the reason that somebody has a horrible life or they were the reason for somebody's success and they still don't remember. Ladies and gentlemen, for us, they might just be words things that we throw away. Sometimes you might, because we're all human, sometimes you might have a bad day. You're in a bad mood. You have trouble at home and you come into work and you might say the wrong thing to a colleague or to a friend or to someone. And for you, they might be just words. But you don't know what effect it could be in that person. You can make someone up 
or you can destroy him just by something that you said. I wish you all the best of luck and thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you so much, Mohammed.